I'm going to run through um, the very basics now of heat engines and relating that to the specific first law um, and second law of thermodynamics. So I'll start off with a very basic diagram, um, most basic we have of uh, a heat engine. So we've got um, a heat reservoir, which is basically a large uh, amount of a substance which is very, very hot, so it's got a high temperature. So note that T subscript H. And we've got um, a corresponding low temperature reservoir down here. T cold. Uh, as you know, heat spontaneously flows from hot to cold. So in the same way that my cup of coffee, I've left it there on the desk and it's gone cold now, uh, it, that heat from that coffee has been transferred through the mug into the desk and into the surrounding air. So I'll make a new one in a minute after I've done this. If that heat starts to flow, and the heat is flowing due to this difference in temperature, remember these two temperatures are the same, no heat will flow. But um, So heat is denoted as Q, and remember heat is a process. So QH up here, um, and QC down here. That heat's flowing, we can take some of that heat and convert it into useful work. And when we talk about work in thermodynamics, it's principally mechanical work, that's the stuff we're interested in. Um, so in the case of an engine, obviously the mechanical work would be rotational, um, so mechanical energy, and then if we have, say, a power station, that mechanical energy is then used to turn uh, a generator and create electrical energy. So we can have something in the middle here, some sort of box, and we can get some work out. <clears throat> we can't get all of the work, we can't convert all of the heat into work. Um, that will contravene the second law of thermodynamics because the heat has to flow. So at least it's a bit like um, uh, in electronics. So think of the temperature as your voltage. When you've got a potential difference, a difference in voltage, current will flow and that's equivalent to heat here. So we need to maintain this difference in temperature. If we destroy that temperature gradient, no heat will flow, so we can't take any work out. So it stands, due to the second law, we can't take all of the heat out of this. Some of it has to flow down here in order to keep this flow going, so we can tap off or extract some of that heat energy and convert it into mechanical work. Uh, we have the opposite. So the opposite is called a heat pump. Um, what we're going to do now is make heat flow in the opposite direction, so from cold to hot. It won't spontaneously do this. We start to break the laws of thermodynamics if we, we think that will happen. What we have to do now is put some work in to move that heat. So, work goes in, and we move the heat from cold to hot. So this is the way that a refrigerator works, or a freezer, um, <clears throat> and things like that. So the work put in, in this case, we've got your domestic fridge freezer, work in electrical work, and we're moving heat out of the cold compartment. Um, that, so the exhaust, exhaust temperature is hotter than our target temperature as such. And that's the hot air that comes out the back of the fridge freezer where you've got your um, uh, coils and stuff. So you fill down the back of the fridge freezer and you'll feel the warm air rising up. That's warmer or hotter than the temperature in the cold compartment, okay? which are keeping your uh, beer in the fridge cold or white wine, um, or your pizzas and vodka in the freezer. Okay, so this is broadly how it works. On draw now um, is a uh, a heat engine in a bit more practical way, so you can start to see some of the components and how it works. So, 
that's as far as I'll go with, um, I'm not going to draw a diagram of a heat pump. Um, just due, due to time. <clears throat> so, um, I'm not completely au okay with all the symbols, but anyway, uh, we've got a, some sort of pump. So that's our work in here. Um, come up here. Quality pens. I'll do it in red. So there's our boiler. So that's our heat in. So we pump some water around a closed loop system. We put heat in, so we've combusted something, uh, coal, oil, uh, it could be nuclear fusion, uh, fission, not fusion. Um, so now we have a superheated fluid, comes round into this is our turbine. Okay, this is where we get our work out. So that will then be connected to a generator, electricity comes out. And going back to the original diagram, again we have to exhaust that heat to a whole reservoir. If we draw a line from here to here, we contravene the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, so this has to come out here now. Um, into what's called a condenser. So to cool the fluid back down, so we can then recycle it round. That's our condenser. And that's our Q out. And then we complete the loop. Okay. Obviously, it follows that we're going this way round. Okay, so in a clockwise direction on that diagram. <coughs> right, we want to define um, an efficiency value for this. Um, the efficiency is basically what we get out versus what we put in. What we're putting in is our hot heat here, so our fuel effectively. Okay, so we can define a, a thermal efficiency. So the thermal efficiency is the ratio of the work. So the work out, this is what we get, versus our hot temperature in. We're not concerned about this. This is loss. It's Q, QC. Okay. Um, Bit more board rubbing. I have to do it this way because the board rubbers just smear the pen across the board. <clears throat> okay, now going back to the first law. Um, which states that uh, Q minus W, so that's sigma there, um, equals a change in internal energy. Um, this is a closed system, so that is equal to zero. If we cycle around and round and round, there's no, net, there's no change in internal energy with time for, for a complete cycle. Um, so uh, Q minus W equals zero. So then what we can say is the work equal to the difference in the two heat reservoirs, the amount of heat. So QH minus QC, which means uh, that our efficiency now equals QH minus QC All temperatures in Kelvin, please. Um, sorry, temperatures, and obviously all in SI units for heat. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself now. Um, when it comes to uh, the theoretical efficiency, the Carnot efficiency, the neat little trick we can do is we say that um, for a difference in temperature, all of the heat is transferred. Um, so none of it is lost, effectively. So if we're looking at uh, the Carnot efficiency, 
these Q's just turn into T's. So you just use the temperature values. So this is probably something you are, again, familiar with. Um, so they just turn to the hot temperature minus the cold temperature divided by hot temperature again. Okay, so a neat little trick, really. So that's how we define uh, the thermal efficiency. It's this, this ratio. Okay, our useful stuff out, that's our work done, um, minus the heat, or divided by the heat that we put in, so what we put into the system. Um, this efficiency will all, always be less than one, it has to be, otherwise we contravene the uh, second law. The same we can put all of the heat out of the hot reservoir and convert it to useful work. Again, that's not true. We have to exhaust some heat to a cold a cold sink or a cold source to make sure that heat flows and then we can pull some um, work out or pull some energy out and convert it into mechanical work or useful work. Okay. So you'll get um, various ways of efficiency less than one. Now I'm going to draw um, a couple of cycles on uh, PV diagrams just to go into a bit more detail about how we can um, calculate um, efficiency and look at calculating the heat uh, transfer in certain heat transfer processes and the amount of work done. Right, um, I've drawn standards of a uh, very standard heat engine cycle here. Uh, this is actually um, out of the workbook. Uh, Question one from section seven, exactly the same um, cycle. Um, so we can look at it. We've got these two processes are diabatic, these are our work processes. Um, so work goes in between one and two. Between two and three, that's our heating heating uh, process. So we queue in again. Heat and work processes are always, on these four process diagrams, always um, opposite each other. So I'll work out this here, a diabatic um, expansion. Work out. And then here, one to four is our exhaust heat. So Q out. Okay. So we've got uh, an isochoric um, heat out and an isobaric heating. Okay. Right, so we look at the heat processes. Um, from one to two and three to four, there's no, no heat transfer. These are work processes. Um, we look at it, um, use big Qs. Um, so Q in, which is from two to three. So Q uh, two, three. Again, it's um, uh, constant pressure, isobaric. So it's equal to the mass times Cp times our two, uh, temperature differential. So T3 minus T2. Remember, on this diagram, um, well, I'm going to draw this very badly now, um, but we have. Um, isotherms coming down. Um, I won't draw them now, this is a diabatic line, so it's between two isotherms and my drawing's not very good. But we have got um, isotherms come down like this. Okay, so temperature at three is higher than it is at two. <coughs> so that's our the definition of our Q in, or we can write it um, specifically, so per unit mass, which would be uh, Q23 equals Cp C3 minus T2. Okay. We can do the same uh, with the, the heat out. So this is uh, Q4 to 1. Now this time it's uh, isochoric, constant volume. So it's equal to Cv again uh, temperature at 4 is higher than it is at 1. Now 
Now remember from the formula for thought, our efficiency is equal to that. That will write it um, because the mass is cancelled uh, anyway. Uh, we'll, do, we'll write it like that. But you can write it large Q or little Q. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, we're going to do this per unit mass. So we can write in full. And remember the work done is the difference in the, the heats. So it's um, Q23 minus Q41. So the heat out, or heat in minus heat out. So the work is equal to uh, Cp T3 minus T2 minus Cb T4 minus T1 and divided by the hot temperature. So Cp T3 minus T2. So that way we can work out the work done by our cycle and also its efficiency. As you know, you can also work out from these diagrams, the network done is the area inside uh, this shape. Okay, so if you maximize the internal area of that process cycle, you maximize the amount of work you get done. Okay, and the way you can do this is obviously, the key one is in increase the temperatures. So if you increase your hot temperature, and your cold temperature. Um, and you see this, you can use the uh, Carnot equation, which is very simple. Um, to get a Carnot efficiency of one, uh, we basically have to exhaust heat to zero degrees Kelvin, which is slightly colder than temperature of space. So that's the way to boost an efficiency is make an engine that has a very a reasonably hot temperature on Earth. It doesn't have to be super hot, but we have to exhaust a very, very cold temperature. So could make one that went from somewhere in the atmosphere out into space it'd have incredible efficiency. Highly impractical. Um, so yes, we can increase this. And basically the way that you work out the work done in that fashion is to uh, subtract the area beneath process one to two. So work out, subtract that from the work in, uh, from the work out, which is um, from three to four. So we uh, subtract those one area from the other, you end up with the area inside this um, this cycle path. <clears throat> okay, so that's a real basic overview of um, uh, a heat engine, uh, first and second law, and how to calculate efficiency, and also the, the work done, network done, um, and in terms of these equations, how to work out uh, the heat that flows in or out again and be based on the type of process used.